I was completely shocked that he said this, uh, but it turned out, of course, that David's comment proved to be almost as profound as the fact that socks are kinase. Fast forward a decade or so, during which time I had this wonderful lab, Nancy Speck and Erica Golemis and Nancy Manley and these wonderful people, and they worked on viruses and enhancers and how they caused types of viruses, cancers, it was fabulous. Throughout the cancer center, oncogenes were getting discovered left and right. Some were kinases, some weren't. Some people won Nobel Prizes. Cloning came along, cellular oncogenes were discovered. Some were kinases, some were not. Some were the same as viral oncogenes, some were not. Then tumor suppressors came along. It was unbelievably exciting. So I left cancer research. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt I didn't have any particular expertise to figure out how oncogenes work. It was pretty obvious now what you had to do. You get inhibitors for them, and then you see if you can cure cancer. Other people were better trained to do it. I said, let them do that hard work. I changed fields. I went to zebrafish. There were only a couple of labs in the US at the time. I fell in love with the fish. I thought it could be a great model organism for genetic research. Guess what? My colleagues said, oh, you'll never get a grant. Soon you'll be out of science. Eureka, I'd found another graveyard. <laughs> I might have a knack for this. But you know, it worked out. So how did it work out? Same as cancer research, because it's MIT. And one thing, we could grow fish better than anybody else, it turned out. And why was that? It was the quality of the water in the cancer center. <laughs> And then remarkable people came to my lab. I, I had bagfuls of applicants, people. There weren't many fish labs. They wanted to do fish. Shu Lin, Nick Guyano, Adam Amsterdam, Tina Yoon. And one day, I heard Amgen had given money to the biology department, thanks to Phil, and faculty could apply. All you had to do was write a two-page grant. I applied for $30,000. A couple of weeks later, a man from Amgen calls me up, and he said, could you use $10 million? I said, no. I don't, <laughs> I don't need 10 million, I only need eight. <laughs> he said, so they gave us $8 million. And honestly, it's very, very hard to fail at MIT. So the experiment was very risky, it was very hard. We had no idea if it would work, it was another cliff to fall off. But one day Adam came and showed me the data and we knew, we knew it was gonna work. We're gonna isolate 25% of all the genes essential to make a baby fish. Boy, was that fun. So I did indulge in this minor detour that was alluded to, and that was after 20 years, I figured out part of the reason people always thought I was about to fail was because I was a woman. Uh, I thought, well, men take risks, and people think that's great, but women take risks and think, well, they might fail. Anyway, whatever, uh, in 95, I joined forces with other tenured women faculty in the School of Science. There were all 15 of us out of 212 tenured faculty, and they kind of figured out the same thing. And with a lot of help from Bob Bergenau, who was the dean, and Chuck Vest, who was the president, we documented the effects of what's come to be called unconscious gender bias and so forth. And um, MIT fixed it. And along the way became, of all things, a national leader in gender equity. And I learned a lot about what makes a great institution from that experience. And I can tell you that MIT is a great institution. And that's why uh, they were able to do such a thing uh, at that time, I think. Meanwhile, back in the lab in 2005, with Adam Amsterdam and Sarah Farrington and Kirsten and my colleague Jackie Lees, we discovered a new class of haploinsufficient tumor suppressor genes in zebrafish, which are ribosomal proteins. So suddenly I was back in the cancer field, and here's where you guys come in. I got to look and see what you had been up to while I was out having fun. And I had charged you with curing cancer, so how have you done? <laughs> well, here's what I have to say about what you've done. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I have to say, when I came back and began to catch up again on cancer research and what had been learned in cell biology and cancer research, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, it's breathtaking what has been accomplished. And this is because so many people, as was said this morning, in this room who came to this great place, went out, found out, did great research, really became a network all over the world doing this kind of research. And what has been learned is astonishing. And it has begun to pay off in spectacular ways with Levac and Herceptin and so forth. Well, if it's so great, uh, why do we need a new building? <laughs> and <laughs> Come to think of it, if you're so fabulous, why haven't you cured cancer? <laughs> and why do we need engineers, for heaven's sakes? Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to hearing Bob and David answer those questions. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, as my close friend Larry Summers would say, <laughs> This, this
this is just a hypothesis. <laughs> The reason cancer hasn't been cured, not enough women at the... <laughs> not enough women at the top. Uh, anyway, pops, I think, that, and seriously speaking, uh, maybe we lack leadership, Some, something's holding us back because in my mind, looking at it objectively, having come back, somehow the great science has not translated itself rapidly enough in my mind into development of drugs for the treatment and prevention of cancer. I don't know, really know why, but who can you blame if not the leadership of government, industry, medicine, we might as well cover them all. And if that's where the engineers come in, I am coming near the end here. Um, uh, for four years, 2000, 2004, I served in MIT's central administration. My job was to fix gender bias at MIT. And when I started this job, I told our wonderful provost, Bob Brown, Bob, Unconscious gender bias is a very tough problem to fix. At least 900 of our 975 faculty have never even heard of unconscious gender bias. Do you realize how hard it's going to be to educate these people? Bob Brown was looking increasingly offended as I waxed on. He said, Nancy, this is MIT. We're engineers, and engineers solve problems. <laughs> I found out he wasn't kidding, they do, and that's why I voted along with others to bring engineers to the Cancer Center. I think we need, in addition to the Cancer Center's great science, people who solve problems for a living, some out-of-the-box approaches to cancer. For example, considering, consider the following small factoid. My primary, this is sort of off the top of my head, just a little fact. My primary doctor at MIT is Michael Kane. He tells me they never see, almost never see fatal colon cancer at MIT anymore. Why is that? Because colonoscopy has reduced the incidence of fatal colon cancer by more than 90%. We have to seriously worry that we are going to be preempted by Katie Kirk and proctologists. <laughs> this we have to worry about. <laughs> we need to exploit the great science that has been done by you people in this room and move much more rapidly to cure cancer. Phil's talked about a culture. We need a culture of yes, we can, <laughs> and yes, we will. In, we need it in this Koch Center, we are gonna cure cancer. And those of you who come there are gonna do it. Cancer has to be a two-building problem because some of us are not going to have time to move into a third cancer center. <laughs> so it's got to be solved by you, and it will be, and it can be. So I just want to say thank you to all of you, to the students, to the postdocs, to the technicians, to my colleagues, to our extraordinary leaders, David Baltimore, Phil Sharp, Richard Hines, Tyler Jacks, for 37 years of extraordinary science in a building that we love. <laughs> and it's been a wild and wonderful trip. Thank you very much. <laughs>